her to come and rest in you, the work that you have done and are doing for us and in us. Thank you for the restoration that you bring about in us. And Lord, my prayer is that the fragrance of the Sabbath will continue with us throughout the week ahead. So Lord, we lay ourselves, our speaker this morning, our community, our hopes and dreams, our future, our loved ones, we abandon into your hands. Thank you for your goodness. I praise you and worship you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hello kids, you are the faithful you here every Sabbath, so nice to see you today. And uh, we can to do a little illustration that probably a lot of the old people have seen many times, but it's so important for us. Have any of you got into trouble this week? Hmm. I won't ask you what you got into trouble for. That might be a little bit embarrassing, hey? But you know, sometimes we don't do the things that our mommies and daddies tell us to do. Then we get into trouble. Sometimes at school, we're busy talking when we're supposed to be listening to the teacher. You always, oh dear, always. Notice that mommy and daddy always listen to the teachers. Remember your mommy and daddy also teachers, eh? Okay. But sometimes we get into trouble and then we, we it's not so pleasant when people are cross with us. Sometimes we feel bad too about the things that we've done that aren't right, hey? And it can really worry us. And we so wish that we could change and we could be loving and kind and thoughtful and all those kind of things. Not so. And sometimes we decide, well, today I'm not going to do anything naughty. Does it last for really long? No. By the end of the day, oh dear, I've done lots of things again that I shouldn't have done. Oh, maybe tomorrow I'll try better. And then tomorrow we get up, oh, I'm going to really try hard today to do good things and not do any naughty things. Then by the end of the day, oh dear, I failed again. So I want to show us a little illustration over here. You see here is a little drawing. What are some of the things that we read over there? Selfishness. Telling lies, selfishness, laziness. Stealing laziness. Okay. That's just that's just a few things that naughty things that we can do. Hey. There are lots of other things. We're very creative at coming up with naughty things to do. Hey. Well, Jaden's going to do something for me. Jaden. Uh, let's just put this over here. Now I want you to stand up here on the pulpit, at least not the pulpit, on the rostrum. And I want you to see this stick over here represents our good lives, our righteousness, can represents what we're trying to come to stand over there, otherwise you might just land on my head. Okay, now Jaden's going to concentrate on dealing with all those naughty things over there. Come on, Jaden, see how good you can be at, oh dear, try again, try, see if you can, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, not so good. But there's a way that we can make a big difference. Because instead of concentrating on how good we can be and how we can avoid doing naughty things, if we can concentrate on something that is more important than that, then we bring balance to our lives. Turn it round, turn it round. Okay. That's a whole lot easier, isn't it, when we concentrate our energies and our and our efforts on keeping in contact with Jesus that makes a big difference. Now, 
let's make this practical. What does it mean to focus on Jesus? Right? What do you think it means to focus on Jesus? Uh, uh, be good. Listen to the Ten Commandments. To pray every day. Okay. To read the Bible, to pray every day. Okay. Now let me just tell you. You know, it's possible to get down on our hands and knees, fold our arms, fold, fold our hands and say, Dear Jesus, and we say the same things every day. Now it's not to say that we can't say this, the same things every day, but... Jesus is our friend. Do you know that he is at the right hand of God and he has everything in heaven that is available to give to us? So when we come to him, we can pray to him as our friend who is representing you and me before God. So we can talk to him. So prayer is a way of talking to Jesus. Okay. What do we do when we're reading the Bible? Are we just reading so that we can tick it off? Up, oh, I read my Bible today. What do we do when we read the Bible? We read it until we get bored. Mm, no, we don't want to do that. We read till we understand. We read until we understand. That's right. We want to understand what Jesus is trying to say to us in the Bible that day. Okay, what other things can we do to uh, keep in contact with Jesus during the day? What about, okay. Being kind to other people. Yes. Let's start off with family worship. It's good to have family worship as well. And the neighbors. Okay, and we can think about how we can be kind to other people because Jesus wants us to be like that. Hey. Not, not just think about ourselves being kind. That's right. Think about others. Yes. And also we can go to Sabbath school and church where we can learn about Jesus as well. That's why we're here today, not so. So let's remember that the most important thing is to focus our lives, our thoughts on Jesus. Talk to him often during the day and other people too. Okay, thank you so much. Shall we just pray together? Dear Jesus, we know that the most important thing is for us to focus on Jesus. But we also know that the only way that Jesus can really become real to us is through the Holy Spirit. We pray that you will help us to understand and to invite the Holy Spirit into our lives so that we can become like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Um, thank you. We have the privilege right now of returning our offerings and the Lord's tithes at this time. Um, there are QR codes um, on the screens. And of course, our kids are coming around with the little hands offering that supports um, children in the schools. So um, let's give cheerfully to the Lord this morning. Thank you.
Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for this privilege that we have of worshipping our Maker and Redeemer by returning just a small portion of what you have poured out into our lives. Lord, help us to remember that you are our sufficiency. You are our provider. You invite us to seek first your kingdom because you take care of our needs. Thank you for that assurance, Father. I pray your blessing on these offerings and tithes that you will multiply and, and that they be used according to your will and purpose. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> when I first arrived here this, this morning, I thought, oh, we're only going to have a small congregation. But I see you've decided to come. And God bless you and me as we share together today. <clears throat> the title of the sermon today is Ramping Up Our EAF. How many of you have heard of EAF, reading news and so on? Well, we'll discover what that means just now. The secondary title is, um, can read it over there. Com tell us. Okay. Con combating spiritual load shedding. Our scripture today is found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. This is a new experience, so if the writing is a little bit small for you there, you'll understand. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20 is one of the most powerful verses in the whole Bible. In fact, it tells us our purpose of being here. Let's turn to that for those of you who can't read what's on the, on the board. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Actually, I want to read it to you because what I have here is uh, the authorized version of the Bible. And the reason I've chosen this one is because I want to understand the power import of the words that are here. It says, all authority and power, that's all power. Let me talk. All authority, that's all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Imagine that. All authority in power has been given to Jesus, our friend. Uh, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. And what does that mean to make disciples of all nations? It means help the people to learn of me, to believe in me and obey my words baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. What does that mean? Remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstance, and on every occasion, even to the end of the age. Load shedding has become the norm in South Africa. We regularly consult our ESCOM Sapush app so that we can arrange our lives around when electricity is going to be available. We have emergency light bulbs at home. We have uh, LED lights that are rechargeable. And for those who can afford it, backup inverters, backup generators, solar power sources. And we are told this will at least continue for the next year, and probably, if we know what the promises are that the government gives us, it might well last longer. What is the cause of all of this? <clears throat> well, I won't go into the many factors that is beyond the scope of our sermon today. But I'm sure that you have read them. What we do know, though, is that 
many ESCOM power stations in South Africa are running at only 30 to 50 percent of the energy availability factor. That means that many of them are broken or they're constantly uh, needing to be repaired. With that level of energy output, it is no wonder that the power system is struggling to keep the lights on. Somehow, we get used to poor service, broken promises, insufficient or unreliable power. As humans, this is a coping mechanism to help us to be able to cope with the stresses of, um, of unreliability. Can this happen in our spiritual lives as well? Is it possible that we become used to living at less than our full potential, to just getting by, instead of becoming all that God intended us to achieve as his disciples? Earlier this year, uh, it was the end of January, my good friend David uh, told us about an experience that happened in Nigeria on the 22nd of January this year, where 10,000 people were baptized in one day. Imagine, 10,000 people. I mean, our church here probably has about 150 people at the moment. Imagine 10,000 people wouldn't even be able to fit in this church. And he, we were chatting afterwards and he said to me, David, you're a gynecologist. Uh, how can we improve the fertility of Helderberg College Church? Well, I've been thinking about that all this time, David, in case you didn't think about it. Uh, and it's true that in the way in which we conceive of church, 10,000 people in one day is just amazing. But the Bible informs us of one other time in the history of our, our world when there were also large numbers of people who came into church. When the kingdom of God grew in leaps and bounds. I began a journey through the book of Acts on the 8th of January 2021. That's two and a half years ago. And every week uh, I send out a little devotional covering some aspect of that journey. So far, we've only reached chapter 22 in two and a half years. There's so much that is there that we can learn about our spiritual journey. It has become a great source of inspiration to me, and I believe others have also been inspired by the thoughts that come from the book of Acts. <clears throat> What was it that motivated my study in this book? It was the thought that just as the disciples after the resurrection faced the huge challenge of evangelizing the world with their very limited natural resources, we too, as Christians in today's world, have a daunting prospect ahead of us. In fact, if it were to depend upon the historical methods of evangelization, it would be an impossible task. Perhaps there is much about the story of the early Christian church that can instruct us, not only for all Christendom, but particularly for Helderberg College Church, our church. How can fertility in Helderberg College Church be ramped up? If we think about the state of the church, or the early church, the apostolic church, after the crucifixion of Jesus, they were a pretty weak bunch of dis despondent, discouraged, and incompetent workers in the kingdom of God. But just a few weeks later, a total transformation had occurred. During those 40 days from the time that Jesus was crucified, until the time that Jesus ro uh, rose um, to heaven, uh, was transported to heaven, he met with them on a number of occasions. We know that he met them in the upper room on at least two occasions that are reported. We know that he uh, spoke to the, those two disciples as they walked to Emmaus. We know that he went down to Galilee, and it is reported that he met with more than 500 people at one time. 
So Jesus spent a lot of time instructing the disciples during those 40 days. He reviewed with them the scriptures and what they taught about the coming of the Messiah. Finally, it seemed the penny dropped, and they gave up their grandiose ideas of an Israel becoming the premier political power of the world, and especially of they themselves becoming powerful and influential statespeople. What caused the vital difference between the disciples before and after Pentecost? We read in Acts chapter 1 verse 18, they all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. The disciples came together in the upper room and also in the temple courts. They came seeking a common purpose. They recognized that they jointly needed something outside of themselves to accomplish the mission that Jesus had given them. Oops, sorry. Acts 2 verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. One accord. They had the same ambition, the same desire to fulfill the mission that God had given them. They now had a friend at the right hand of the Father who had promised them all the power and resources of heaven at his disposal. Imagine, imagine that. Having Jesus at the right hand of God, having the full bank of heaven available to be able to accomplish what needed to be done. Don't you think that they also had uh, sins that they needed to confess one to another? <clears throat> sins of unkind words, sins of unpleasant or unkind thoughts toward each other, sins of pride and superiority. Remember how often they had had heated discussions about who was the most competent at leading the group and who should have the most important positions in the new political order. But here they put aside their differences as they acknowledged their weakness and their need of forgiveness. Basically, they allowed the Holy Spirit to subjugate their self-centeredness and clear away the obstructions in their lives so that they could become fully available as wide open channels through whom he could pour out his transforming power. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to talk in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. That was such an amazing experience where these simple, weak, inefficient um, lay people became great, great warriors for Christ, great evangelists, and in fact, um, great things happened as a result. Did it depend upon special gifts or skills or advanced training? Not that any of these things are wrong. After all, we are here at Helderberg College, at the Helderberg College of Higher Education. Although God could use humble fishermen like Andrew and Peter, James and John, tax collectors like Matthew, political activists like Simon the Zealot, and other just very ordinary people, he could also use, in a wonderful way, highly educated people like Rabbi Paul. But the most important prerequisite was not skill or education, but humility and a willingness and a commitment to be used by God. Also vitally important, a personal experience of salvation a personal testimony of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what that meant to them individually. In Acts chapter 2, verse 32, all the disciples could vouch for the resurrection of Jesus. That was one of the preconditions of becoming an apostle. But it was obvious also to the Jewish leaders that something had changed inside the apostles. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, we read, 
Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. The key to their success was the fact that they had been with Jesus. Yes, they had spent three and a half years in the presence of Jesus and had certainly been exposed to his teachings and to his character of love and compassion. But after the resurrection of Jesus, they had a new perception of what Jesus was all about, how patient he had been with them, and above all, how much he loved and cared about them. <clears throat> Through their ministry, they turned the world upside down. First, those 3,000 people who were baptized in one day. Within a few short weeks, the number of believers had risen to 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. This is where the book of Acts becomes such an exciting story of the Holy Spirit's mighty work through the disciples and the deacons and the, and the members of the church. The Pharisees and priests were amazed at the power and confidence that the apostles displayed. What a difference from just a few weeks before when they all ran away when Jesus was arrested. The key to fulfilling the commission to go to the whole world to make disciples of all nations is not better plans, although God is a God of order and foresight. It is not about better technology and wider coverage, although God can use technology better than any modern communicator. It is not about whipping up enthusiasm and organizing rallies and conventions to discuss evangelism, although these can focus our attention on, a, on outreach. What is needed is for each of us to catch a vision of God's love for us personally. To understand that I am an imperfect person, loved deeply and passionately by a perfect God. And then to realize that he is as much in love with my neighbor, my colleague, my relative, my classmate, my boss, my detractor, and the person who gives me such a hard time. He loves the beggar in the street, the car guard, the teller at the bank, the cashier in the supermarket, the rubbish picker, the officious official in the government department, the stern officer who seems out to catch me, traffic officer. Yes, and he even loves corrupt, power-hungry and greedy politicians. He certainly doesn't condone their actions, but yet he loves them. These are all precious souls that he died to save. He emptied heaven's bank to make it possible. He is totally invested in this world and he wants you and me to be part of his mission to accomplish that goal. You and I have the privilege of being conduits of that grace. We have opportunities to be the face, the ears, the eyes, the hands and the feet of Jesus. We daily are having real-time contact with all these people that we mentioned before. Imagine how Jesus would deal with each one of them. What would he say to some of the politicians? What would he say to the, the rubbish pickers? What would he say to the car guard if he were to deal with them today? How would he express his love to them in practical ways? When Jesus was walking in the paths of Judah and Samaria and Galilee, he could only be in one place at any given time. But through the universal presence of the Holy Spirit, Christ's influence can be everywhere in all of our lives as fully and as powerfully 
as if we were in the personal presence, as if we were in the personal presence of Jesus. Imagine the effect in Somerset West if you and I were each fully available to the ministry and power of the Holy Spirit in our de dealings with people that we meet each day. I'm not talking about standing on a public platform and preaching powerful sermons. I'm talking about showing kindness and compassion, listening deeply and personally to someone's pain, comforting someone in their loss, sharing food with someone who is hungry, being a friend to our neighbor with no strings attached, appreciating the cleaner at work and the packer in the supermarket, showing patience to the student in our class. And by the way, teachers have the most amazing privilege and responsibility to mold the lives of the children that are in their class and to point them to someone who can give them purpose in their lives. Is there a place for giving a Bible study, sharing gospel literature? Of course. But that is not where it starts. And thank you, Annette, for that beautiful song, because that represents what we're talking about today. Imagine if we could walk through life seeing people as Jesus saw them. If our lives could be a sweet aroma of love and joy and compassion. Imagine if we had the ability like Jesus did, to say words that could inspire deep spiritual insights and penetrate confusion and pain and discouragement and offer hope and purpose to life. As I look back on my own life, I see many embarrassing moments when I felt obligated to say something, to do evangelism. So often it was impersonal, dutiful, and often inappropriate. So often it treated people as objects to be instructed or changed, people who had wrong ideas that needed to be corrected. I remember when I was studying medicine at Cape Town during the school holidays, I spent a few holidays doing literature evangelism, going from door to door, selling Bible stories and uh, Christian books. Sometimes I would knock on the door and somebody would invite me inside and it turned out that they were Jehovah's Witnesses. And inevitably we got into an arguing match about interpretations of the Bible. And afterwards I always felt like there was a bad taste in my mouth because after all I, I wasn't making a friend, I was making an enemy. And that's not what it's all about. We started this discourse today about EAF. What does EAF stand for? Energy Availability Factor. We know how it affects our physical lives when we suffer load shedding and disruptions. We are told it may be years, as I mentioned before, before the problem is resolved. But we have the possibility to increase the EAF of our spiritual experience a hundredfold today and every day. We just need to be willing to be used by God and implore him to take away the obstructions and the blockages in the channels of our lives through which he longs to pour out his blessing upon the world around us. Now here you can see a vast lake that is being held up by that damn wall. Well, there doesn't seem to be much water flowing, but if you look at the little river to the side of the screen, you'll see that there must be some water that is running there. But just think of the massive resources that are available in that dam that are being underutilized. <clears throat> the valves have not been opened. There is an obstruction to the free flow of that life-giving water resource. The full benefit of that huge body of water has been untapped. I don't know how many of you have ever stood on a dam wall where all the, the channels are open wide. I have had that experience, standing on what used to be called Fervut Dam wall, and you feel the rumble and you hear the enormous 
roar of that water as it rushes out of, out of the channels in that dam wall. Um, you can see there on the top of the corner those tiny little people standing looking at that massive power that is coming through, through that, um, that wall. Note this statement from the Acts of Apostles. And again, it's quite small, and I'll read it to you. It is not because of any restriction on the part of God that the riches of his grace do not flow earthward to men. So God is not holding back. God is not saying, um, I'm not going to give you this. He, he wants to give it to us. He wants to give us power to be able to accomplish his purposes. If the fulfillment of the promise is not seen as it might be, it is because the promise is not appreciated as it should be. If all were willing, all would be filled with the Spirit. That is you and me. Wherever the need of the Holy Spirit is a matter little thought of, there is seen spiritual drought, spiritual darkness, spiritual declension, and death. Whenever minor matters occupy the attention, things like church and school politics, the fighting with our fellow workers, issues that irritate us, fighting over policies, personality clashes between fellow workers. I'm sure you think these never happen in our church, but they do. The divine power which is necessary for the growth and prosperity of the church and which would bring all other blessings in its train is lacking, though offered in infinite plenitude. Wow, what a powerful statement. And so to summarize, Jesus showed that it is not only highly skilled people on which he depends as the administrators of his love and grace. It certainly is not only dependent upon the pastors. He can even use fishermen, tax collectors, farmers, mechanics, housewives, cleaners, teachers, and maybe especially teachers, nurses, doctors, bookkeepers, painters, carpenters, and yes, pastors also. Anyone who is able to experience and share a simple understanding of the gospel. In the parable of the judgment scene, where Jesus separates the sheep and the goats, he is not identifying those who can give a full exposition of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Even though they have wonderful blessings for our faith when we grasp their import. He is not looking for how well we keep the Sabbath. Even though for the lover of Jesus, Sabbath is a blessed anchor to keep us connected to him. He is not looking for how faithful we are in returning tithes. Even though tithe is a symbol of how much we appreciate and trust his faithfulness. But he separates them according to how much they have become loving and compassionate in their relationship to the needy, the suffering people around them. How much they are willing to share the resources that God has given them to bless those with whom they rub shoulders each day. All he asks is for dedicated, humble, open hearts willing to be used by the Holy Spirit to practically demonstrate the love and compassion of Jesus. When we allow him to remove the obstructions in the channels of his grace, our lives can become free-flowing, abundant conduits of his power and grace. Only then can our words and lives be used by him to communicate the truth of God's saving grace in ways that are appropriate and effective. Johnny was a Down syndrome child. As expected, he had a childlike approach to life. But he had grown up in a Christian family, and he loved Jesus. 
His parents had managed to get him a job in a nearby supermarket as a packer at the till. <clears throat> but he wanted to do something really special for Jesus. And eventually he and his dad came up with a plan. In his pocket he had a supply of little cards, each with a Bible promise. As he handed over the bags of groceries to the owners, he would smile and give each customer one of his cards. One day, the manager noticed that there was a long line of customers waiting at the checkout point attended by Johnny. In an effort to facilitate the speed and efficiency of the checkouts, he tried to redirect some of the customers to other checkout tools, but they would have none of it. Eager to know what was going on, he stood back and observed the scene. Johnny was beaming with joy as he ministered to the customers that came his way. God can even use a simple-minded child with Down syndrome to be the conduit of his grace and love. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. May we, as members of Helderberg College Church, be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to use us every day to touch the lives of those around us. God bless.